Hi, thanks for the welcome. So, if you told me a year ago that I'd be standing here in front of you and that our company would be celebrating its first year anniversary, I definitely would not have believed you for a bunch of reasons, some of which are probably quite obvious and some which may not be. So we're approaching our one-year anniversary. Um, when I got the invitation to come here to, uh, to do this talk, the first question that came up was, why me? There's a lot of very talented people, some of which you've already heard today, that could easily be standing here instead of me. Um, and I actually asked them, I emailed them and said, like, really, like, why me? And the reply that came back was, well, you have to be an expert in your field. And bearing in mind that uh, today's theme is zero to one, I thought, crikey, I'm, I'm an expert at being a zero. So, <laughs> well, we'll figure that out in just a minute. So most people who come on this stage, they have a, a thing, uh, an idea, uh, a vision or a passion that they're, they're really into. And it's certainly true of myself and my co-founder, Raman. And ours is fairly simple to talk about. It's another thing to actually do. And that thing is that we want everybody around the world to be able to automatically grow their own crops and make it fun and most importantly, intuitive and easy, which sounds relatively simple. The easy part is the bit that's not so simple. And why do we want it to be easy? Well, my co-founder and I are very, very lazy people trapped inside these hardworking bodies. <laughs> and we want it to be easy. And why? Because we know how hard it is. Like, we've both got experience growing crops indoors. And it's one thing to grow a crop once, but to be able to do it again and again and again and do it efficiently and really well is very, very difficult. And there are things that we'd be rather doing with our time than running around watering things, getting the lights to work and the temperature to be right and the humidity, such as we'd rather be hiking, we'd rather be fishing, we'd rather be drinking. Oh, we'd rather be <laughs> drinking and fishing. <laughs> like, for sure. Um, now, when we think about it, there are plenty of industries for hundreds and hundreds of years that have been around, but have recently been totally revolutionized by technology. So hundreds of years ago, lots of people were being ferried from A to B in a horse and cart. People were renting out rooms uh, within their accommodation to strangers. And now there's an app for that. Everybody can become a taxi driver, and everybody can rent out a room. So why is that not the case with one of the oldest industries on the planet, which is agriculture? Why are we not? having in our own homes the ability to grow our own crops really easily? Why are we not asking for our schools to teach this to our kids? Why are we not demanding this for the world's most vulnerable people to look after themselves through technology? So it's true that there are products on the market um, that will help you grow a plant a little bit more efficiently, but most of the money pouring into this industry is for cannabis, which isn't necessarily going to do much for our families, right? I mean, maybe it will. Um, make an interesting dinner. <laughs> there, are, there are other places where, you know, indoor farms are getting bigger and bigger, and they're starting to try and optimize things, but really just for their own purpose. So what we think is that uh, a real big game changer would be to democratize the ability for anybody to use technology to efficiently grow indoors automatically and actually redefine what automatically means. So this could be for something the size of a closet right up to acres and acres of production. So what would that look like? So let's just imagine you've got an indoor grow of some description, and you're sitting there. And instead of just having technology turn things on and off, you're actually using artificial intelligence to decide when those things should be turned on or off. And artificial intelligence is making those calculations far quicker than any human person could do it. And it would actually um, stop bad things from happening, such as crop disease. And it would enable a lot of really good things to happen, such as uh, be more energy efficient, and increase the yield of your crop, and my personal favorite, perhaps even changing the taste of what you're growing. Imagine a kid in the north of Canada where you know, fresh fruit is hard to come by and is certainly hard to come by at an affordable price. Wouldn't it be great if the kid is the one who's growing these crops automatically for their community? Wouldn't it be interesting if industrial-sized growers can change the taste of a product based upon demand? Has anyone here eaten kale recently? It's disgusting. So, Somebody has to do something about the taste of some of the stuff that we're eating. <laughs> now, you might be thinking, why are we talking about indoor farming? There's plenty of land, right? We, we can grow outdoors. Well, on the map behind me, um, everything in red 
pink. That shows where we'll be insofar as the amount of produce we can come up with in the year 2050, and it's about 50% less where it's red. And why is that? Well, a whole different reason, but outdoor agriculture has some significant problems, one of which is that it emits a lot of greenhouse gas, like nearly 25%. It's taken up 37% of the land mass we actually have, and probably more worryingly, it's taken up a ton of water. 70% of our resources for water are going into agriculture, whereas indoor farming, actually, you can reduce the consumption by about 90%. So let's grow closer to where we live, because it's stupid to keep trucking you know, strawberries in from Mexico in the winter to Montreal. If you need to grow small, you need to grow big, you need to automate it and make it easy and predictable. And we can do that anywhere in the world, or maybe we should even start thinking about doing it outside of the world. So that, a year ago, was a nice little throwaway dream comment that myself and co-founder Raman had living in the lovely town of Sutton, which is about an hour and a half away from here. For any of you that have been to Sutton, it's great for skiing and hiking and all that kind of stuff, but it's not exactly the sort of tech epicenter of the province. <laughs> I can tell you that confidently because we're the largest tech company in the town. <laughs> and we were when we were two. <laughs> so we're living in Sutton, kids, family, everyone's having a good time. Um, and we, we were talking about this. So what did we do? Well, Raman decided to come up with a prototype because he had a, a small indoor farm in his house, but every time he wanted to go on vacation, he couldn't because you know, the plants wouldn't do so well. And he looked online and he tried to find something that would solve that problem and he couldn't find it, so he started to build it. And we were friends because our kids go to the same school and he showed it to me and we started to look at it and it seemed to be a, a really good idea. So we decided we'll start a business. Now, that sounds simple, we'll start a business, but bear in mind that we both had full-time jobs. He had his own IT business and I had my own business development consultancy. You know, we've got wives with full-time jobs. We've got, at that point, five kids between us, dogs, cats, all of the stuff that's just called life. <laughs> and the other thing that perhaps for you, for those of you who haven't ever tried to start a hardware and a software company, it's like starting two companies at the same time with half the resources. It's called hardware, right? It's hard and it wears on you. It's, it's, it's a good word, but it's, it's really, really, really difficult. So anyway, we were quite naive and we said, you know, how hard can it be? But there should have been that big sign that says reality check. You're not independently wealthy. It's going to take money. Oh, we said, we'll do it, no problem. So um, I got someone to design our first logo for $5. And then we went crazy and spent $10 on a website. And uh, we called ourselves a startup. And somebody believed us and invited us to uh, Las Vegas to attend an agriculture convention. <laughs> so so I, uh, I used my, uh, my, my loyalty points from my credit card, and we got on a, a plane to Vegas, <coughs> which, Raman, you haven't paid me back for yet, actually. So off we went. And all we had really in our hand was basically what you see on, on the screen. It's, uh, uh, a mock-up of what our four pieces of hardware would look like and a, a sort of rough explanation as to how it would connect to all the equipment that's already in an indoor farm, such as you know, humidifiers and feeder pumps and pH mixers and all the stuff that's already there. So the purpose of going was really to show people, like, this is what we have in mind, what was the reaction? Um, when we walked in there, there was a guy standing on the stage uh, called Mike Betts, and he was talking about the the landscape of investment at the time. And it was actually pretty hot. I mean, there was a lot of money pouring into, um, into agricultural technology. So he came off the stage, and Raman sort of stood there, and I went, oh. and I ran after him, and I sort of grabbed him by the shoulder, and I sort of politely asked him to come and sit down and listen to what we had to say, and he did, thankfully for us, because he knew the, the landscape really well, and he was the first person within the uh, industry to to validate at least the idea and say, yeah, you know what, there is a big need for that and you need to get started before somebody else jumps into the space. So with that, we jumped back on our plane, zoomed back to Montreal, full of confidence, and we applied for the Founder Fuel Accelerator program. And this is basically like doing a business MBA in three months and the idea is to get you investment ready. Um, at this point, we were still working full time, but we turned up in our suits and we landed a, a small investment which allowed us to quit our jobs and focus on this full time. And I remember that moment because 
it was probably one of the, the, the first moments where I really felt like something had just clicked into place and it felt, you know, absolutely like we're on the right track. So I remember going home and I said to my wife, um, the six figure income I have, we're going on minimum wage. And I thought, I thought she was really excited because her eyes were really big and her mouth was really big, but she wasn't, she wasn't quite as excited as I was, but she, you know, she ended up uh, being pretty supportive about the whole thing. So what happened next? Well, we went to Founder Fuel with what we thought was a, a, an idea of who we were and what the product was going to do and, and how it was going to work. But the funny thing about an idea is when you start vocalizing it, you get a lot of people questioning what you're saying. And with those questions, you need to have the answers. And we certainly didn't have all the answers at all. And what we thought then sort of merged into more or grew into more of an artificial intelligence powered product and service. And the more we talked about that, we're carrying around this newer idea. The more people we're connecting with, the more input we're getting, the more questions we're getting, the more answers that we need. So I won't say that it's, it was our idea. It was just we were the ones that were walking it around and showing it to people, and then it kind of grew out from there. So at the end of the Founder Field program, um, there's me standing on stage in front of 1,500 people, vocalizing what it was that we were trying to do. And at that point, we started getting people contacting us from all over the world saying that they wanted to become customers, they might want to invest in the company, they might want to join the company as a, a member of the team. So the momentum really started to build really from, from that point. So we built our prototypes. Um, pictured in the, in the shot is a, a price chopper supermarket, and I believe we were the first company to automate growing uh, tomatoes within a, a superstore or a supermarket. Um, and then we deployed these, uh, these prototypes in schools, in indoor farms, in um, hydroponic vertical farming, and even in uh, like a new way of growing, which is like a container farm. So things, again, we, we felt the momentum moving. I don't like reading slides, but this one, I think, is, is pertinent to our story. Um, imagination is more important than knowledge, for knowledge is limited, whereas imagination embraces the entire world, stimulating progress, giving birth to evolution. And why that resonates with me is because we never had all the answers to what we wanted to do, but we had the imagination to visualize what it will look like in the future. And then we had to just find ways to plug those, those gaps that were still a bit hazy. And I think that made all the difference for us because just because you don't have a, a business plan that's you know, A to Z worked out at every single point, it, it, that's not the thing that's going to get you there. It's the determination to figure out those big question marks that you know exist. So now we're growing a, what we call a tribe of, of growers. So all over the world, we've got people contacting us, all raising their hands saying, yeah, we, we like the idea, we think it's needed, and somehow we want to either help you or, or fund you or, or buy your, your product. So the theme of today is zero to one. Um, Everybody in this room, everybody everywhere, when you think you're starting at zero, if you look really, really closely, there are a whole bunch of tiny, weeny little ones that you have. And for Raman and myself, I think when we look back, yeah, we had no money and all that kind of stuff, but for example, we had families that were gonna support us. And I sort of gloss over how hard it was, but you know, we left for Montreal, left our kids behind, left our wives to look after the kids, carry on their full-time jobs, and off we went to Montreal five days a week for three months. So that was a really uh, a big number one to have to be able to do that. Raman has a background in agricultural engineering from McGill, so he understands the mechanics of how a greenhouse works. So that's a, a big win right from the get-go. And I have some experience in business development from a, a technology standpoint. So I think all that to say is that you never really are at zero. And we were determined that we would never have a zero day. Every single day we did something that would push that ball a little bit further along. So we've reached the top of our first number one, our first mountain, and I'm pretty pleased to tell you that um, right now we've raised uh, seven figures and we've got a team of 12 people, which is a pretty amazing thing for me to be able to say. Thank you. <laughs> and just to go off script just a second, um, I think it's important to note that the majority of our team are either first or second generation immigrants, and I'm really proud to say that we, we're that kind of team. <laughs> so, we haven't finished, we're gonna keep going, and now we've got a new number one to get to, um, which is really a, a much, much bigger goal. We wanna have our technology throughout the world, people growing all over the place as quickly as we can, but we're not scared because that's exactly the, what we had to do 12 months ago. Thank you very much. 
Alistair Monk. Merci. Merci.